<laughs> Let me introduce you, Maurice Mitchell, who is the chairman, director, president, what you want to call it, our uh, national it director of the Working Families Party. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. well, you know, um, the last time we spoke actually was before the pandemic. Yes. And, um, you know, things were, there's a particular, there's a particular talk that you gave about if, don't tell me that there isn't, uh, that, that, you want to be non-ideological because being non I, I, I'm paraphrasing, yeah. being non-ideological is in effect ideological. Absolutely. Expand on that for me. Okay, well, we're going, we're going right, we're going into, right it. into it. <laughs> I mean, I think there, in our discourse, there's And I'm sorry, Maurice. Okay, no problem. Yeah. So in our discourse, in like the popular discourse, in a lot of like the mainstream discourse, there is this illusion that you can be non-ideological, right? right? And oftentimes, when people speak um, derisively right. of ideologues, right. like they're often talking about people on the left, actually, right. especially inside of the Democratic Party, right. when, when they're debating ideology. Right. And I think that that is outrageous right. for a number of reasons. Number one, it is assuming that the people, like, let's just take the Democratic Party, then I'm right. going to go broadly. Right. But inside the Democratic Party, when you hear these debates, it assume, it's making this assumption that people that are called quote unquote centrist, and right. I hate that term, yeah. right? Um, that they don't have ideology, right? right? That they're, they're sort of like blank slates ideo ideologically. Right. When they're advancing a very particular ideological worldview exactly. of incrementalism, of neoliberalism, this idea that the markets can take, can kind of handle all the issues that we right. face, even, even these big existential issues that we face, that is a particular philosophy and a particular ideology that is informing public policy, informing debate. So we should name it. We should surface it. And we should have that philosophical debate instead of denying the debate by claiming that there is an ideology. And there's a reason for that because they, they have succeeded in having their ideology be the common sense, right? Right. So you don't have to really like surface it when it's just in the air, right? which is why it's so important for those of us that have issues with it, for those of us that believe that there's huge fallacies and there's more of us than them, right? right. Most, people, far, yeah. most people believe like, hey, this stuff isn't working, right? We may not have the ideological terminology in right. place. But most of us are like, the system isn't working, um, big business doesn't work for us, uh, politics are corrupt, wealthy people and corporations have more power and influence that, that, than they need. Well, there's actually an ideology that puts that in place, right? right? And we want to have that conversation and they don't want to have that conversation. They're scared of the conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is why we even have this fallacy that there's such a thing as being non-ideological, right. right? Or that there are this both sideism. Right. right. Oh, I hate that. The yes. both sideism that there's like a far right and a far left and there's problems in both of these extremes and we need to meet each other in the middle. Right. right? And what I always like to say is like, look, the right and the left are not equal. Right. <laughs> right. You have a right and you have a far right that is violent. Right. That is authoritarian. Right. That is anti-democratic. Then in some some forms of the far right are fascistic. Right. And as much as I could see. The, the worst thing you could say about the left or like the far left is that, yeah, um, sometimes people on the left can be really annoying, yes, right? Yeah. And unless there's a way that you could weaponize being annoying and people could be annoyed to death, right. we should not be both siding these things, right. right? When people on the far right are actually organizing in militias, are storming the Capitol, are trying to use public policy in order to prevent democracy from existing, right. we need everybody people who identify as progressive, people who identify as centrist, people who identify as conservative, recognizing that there is a particular strand of right-wing ideology that seeks to destroy all other ideas. Right. And we cannot tolerate that, right. right? And so we could only have that conversation if we're explicit about the fact that Everything in public life is, an, is part of an ideological right. what, project. What your belief system is. Yes, it's your belief system. And like, you know, the, the term ideology might be confusing for folks. It's just like your belief system. Right. It's just the thing that you use to understand where we are and where, you, where we want to go. Everybody has one of those. Right. Some of them are more coherent than others. Some of them are more, more consistent and, and um, clear than others. But we all have them. 
And if you think you don't have them, then likely you're replicating the dominant status quo worldview. Because you don't really have to talk about having an ideology because the system is you. Yes, so if, if you think you don't have one, then the things that you're doing are likely exactly. replicating the status quo. And what the status quo says is the systems that are in place, the racial and class hierarchies that are in place, uh, the inequality that's in place, right. those things are fine. Right. And we want to lock them in place. Right. And so by carrying on in a non-ideological way, not being curious about your grounding philosophy, you are putting in place and reaffirming that thing. And you should be aware of that. You shouldn't think that what you're doing is neutral. Right. And that's why I, I said that when I said that and why I think it's so important. I actually wrote about this. Right. Um, we need to be clear about who we are ideologically as organizations and as individuals. And I actually believe that the more ideological we are, like the more clear we are about our grounding philosophy, right. the, the, the better it is in, in society because then I could say like, oh, this is where you are. Right. This is where, where I am. This is where we could collaborate. This is where we have differences. Mm -hmm. But when everything is all mushy, it's really hard to do that. And that is actually by the design of the people you know, at the top of the hierarchy. Mushiness is increased in entropy and, and all of that is what is needed. In fact, profit is made on people not knowing stuff. That's why we don't have Medicare for all and all of that. The, 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 the issues that you have when there's so many choices to not real choices, right, but, not real choices. but that's what occurs. Now, I, I said I wanted to talk something about it and a lot of people would not really tie these together. First sure. of all, we know that the working uh, families uh, organization, I mean, the working family party, party yeah. I always mess up. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Sure. That, that we know what uh, that it stands for, livable wages and all the good things that uh, yeah. progressives know most Americans want. 60, 70, 80% of yes. Americans. Yes. Something is happening now we're called AI. Yes. AI is going to affect, at, for once now, the class that thought they were unaffectable, if mm -hmm. that's a word, mm -hmm. are suddenly going to be affected because writers are going to be replaced and mm -hmm. all of these are going to replace them. Now, people are scared. Yeah. I am not scared. I'm, I'm saying we can embrace AI if we had it done in a format that's honest. In other words, AI is nothing more than productivity increases. Mm -hmm. If productivity increases is simply for the wealthy, then it's a problem because, yeah, not only the working class loses jobs, but now the regular folks lose jobs. However, if we have policies now that says, by the way, AI was the composite knowledge of us all. Mm -hmm. And as the composite knowledge of us all, yeah. we should all partake in that, it, that you don't need 50 operators, you only need 10 operators now. Well, we probably need to reduce the work week by 50% or, or mm -hmm, 60%. Mm -hmm. If we look at AI as the composite knowledge and meaning we need to work less, it would work. But in a capitalist system as we oh, have it yeah. today, <laughs> yeah, so, the yeah. spoils are going to go, yeah. you know, work. This yeah. question comes. Yeah, okay, the let me hear the question. Coming. Okay. The question is coming. How is the working families, parties, and others, instead of fighting AI like I've seen in the unions in, in Hollywood, etc., use AI as a matter of saying, no, what it means mm -hmm. is this composite knowledge, the productivity from this composite knowledge needs to be shared. There are two ways to skin a cat. Okay. Stop it yep. or... So let me, let me reframe that a little bit, yes. right? So I don't think there's any real s stopping of technology. No way, right? yes. Technology is a tool, right? right? The thing that I'm curious about is who's wielding that that tool? Power, yes. Right. The other the other questions I'm I'm curious about is that who is realizing the upside from yes. engaging that tool, and if there is a downside, who has to hold the downside? Right. It is a system question. Right. Right. If if the people who are wielding that tool are people who are already privileged, people like. Silicon Valley VCs and others, yes. and if they are also the people who will realize the upside, yes. and then the downsides will be will be held by all of us, mm -hmm. then number one, that's called capitalism. Yes. And I think we're on the road for AI to do that. Not because it's AI, but because we're it's we're living under system. this economic system. Right. Right? Right. Now, so the question is how can our organizing leverage this moment 
right. when workers are realizing their power, right. when actors are going on strike, writers are going on strike, um, you know, UPS drivers are going on strike. Um, how can we how can we take this moment where where AI and automation and robotics are sort of reimagining work? How can we use that as a as an occasion to lead, right? And so what I'm interested in, what is going to be the social justice application mm -hmm. of this technology, right? And then also, what are, the, what are the systems applications? How can we perhaps have a different economic system, right? Where, all right, if this technology, right, is creating more productivity and creating more value, right. how can we realize the value? Because when you look at all of these technologies, right from automation to AI to, exactly. right? They're leveraging the commons. Hey, that's my right? point. So they're yeah. leveraging the commons. They're leveraging what is our common value, right? For example, AI is just like the pulling so in. knowledge from the, everybody. Yes, yes. from yeah. the internet, just knowledge from everybody. Things right. that maybe you wrote, exactly. things that I wrote, right? right? Just sucking it up and making a, a, a model out of that. Right. But then a, a handful of white men in Silicon Valley are gonna be the ones that benefit from the total knowledge of the, so how can we have public policy in place, right, that says, if we're going to, if we're going to realize these benefits, perhaps, mm -hmm. from automation, from uh, the attention economy, and, right. and these algorithms, from AI, all of these tools, how can the public policy be, be put in place to ensure that the, the wealth and the capacity that is derived from these things benefit the commons that actually built these things. And a lot of these things, like a lot of these, like for example, like Elon and Tesla, right? They didn't like do anything, yeah. But, but you know, te like, what, like, like first of all, Elon didn't start Tesla, right? right? But yeah. <laughs> that's a whole other thing. Yeah. But Tesla benefited from a huge government Government grant. contracts. Government contracts, right? That's one of the reasons why Tesla's Tesla, right? Yeah. And then like so many things, we, we overlook as part of the commons, like the interstate highways, the internet, the infrastructure right. of the internet, um, a lot of the research and development coming out of our public in, uh, institutions, our public universities, right? So the public is creating this infrastructure and the groundwork for these businesses and for these VC people to be able to even benefit, right? And, and there's the public knowledge on the internet was yes. created by us. There should be public policy put in place, and it can't just be U.S. because this technology is everywhere. Everywhere. Right. Global public policy put in place to ensure that we, as humanity, can actually benefit from the from the capacity that's being built from these technologies, and that is on us and our organizing. And we need to, to constrain these corporations to hold them accountable to make that happen. I am glad you said that, and I, because one of the things that I I've been putting AI into the productivity domain and the and the commons, you know, because that, that's where it comes from. But if you if you watch the news and watch most of the organizations that get play, we don't hear that message, which is something that I think is important. And I think it is on us, it's on progressives to change the narrative. Because the AI narrative is not what you just said, which it is. And to put it bluntly, AI is just one technology. But from the building of the cars where all this money goes to a few, to every technology that we've had. It has always been the technology of the commons. Mm -hmm. It has all to everything that you see here technological. Yeah. Uh, even when Intel built the processor, it wasn't on just Intel, but it was on the person who understood materials. It was on the person who understood all these things. And I'm glad that you're putting it that way. My next question is sure. how, how do we nationalize, internationalize the message beyond what the mainstream media will do. And you say I have the answer. I want to see if you, what you are going to say okay. about that. So, so you have the answer? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm curious what your answer is. But, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a broken record, right? Yes. So ultimately, I think through our, through our organizing, right, right we, we need to have a popular conversation. Right about these basic facts. You, right. you started off with ideology, right? right? We're, we're often kind of confused about these things. Right. right? So even though, even though all of the value of an economy comes from us, us, us just right. like regular people right. doing what we do. And, and how do I know that? Well, if one day every single 
a fund manager. Mm -hmm. um, died. <laughs> died? Let's, let's get no, no, this. Right? Yes. Our, our economy, our way of life will go on in perpetuity. Yes. If that happened tomorrow. Right. And the reason why we know this for sure is because we all experienced COVID. Right? We all experienced that. Yes. And then the paradigm that somehow placed these titans of capital on top and all of us right. on the bottom, they got flipped. Exactly. And everybody rep understood yes. the value of the, the, what do they call the quote unquote frontline workers. Yes. Right? All of, those, all of that frontline work yes. is the actual work that perpetuates our economy every single day. Right. You know, from food delivery people to nurses, right. to doctors and orderlies, to sanitation workers, right. to the working class, right? Those folks, we're not really sure what they do or what value they actually bring into the economy. And they're like, you know, either like the people who are like developing more and more Baroque sort of financial products that mm -hmm. are based on other financial products that are based on other financial products. Right. But the person that's actually like, like, yes, like it's so abstract, yes. right? Yes. Um, that it's really even hard to understand what's being bought and sold and everything else, right? Like, at the end of the day, we weren't concerned with them and making sure that they could work every single day. We were concerned with how can, how can the food delivery person, how can the people in, uh, working, working behind cash registers and groceries, how can nurses, how can, right? So the point I'm making here is that we need to have a proper, a proper frame, mm -hmm. a proper ideological frame right. to have this conversation. If we are the ones that are constantly the people who produce the value in this economy, then it's only natural that, that we should receive the, the benefit from the value that we put in. How are we putting in all the inputs, but some folks who actually aren't... In, that don't even know how to do it. Right. How are they the ones that are... So with this question around technology, AI, robotics, you know, on and on and on and on, to me... The fundamental problem is the economic system, and once we realize that, then we will organize, right. and we will we will organize. And I think the biggest, the one thing currently, as long as we have a oligarchic form of democracy, mm -hmm. that we could, right, we could use that in order to. This is what we do at Working Families. Right. We believe that working people should govern, not the wealthy, not corporations. We should use the limited purchase we have on democracy to commandeer government exactly right so that we could create public policy in order to constrain capital so that we could ensure that we realize the value uh, everyday people realize the value of our economy what does that look like right a, a robust public health care system including mental health a robust top class educational system from k to university right. the commons parks and libraries and like we we are the wealthiest country in the history of countries, right. right? And so there's enough wealth for all of us to experience that. It's the public policy because we have a corporately captured, um, uh, corporately captured government. It's the public policy that is so skewed to those, to those VC people in Silicon Valley and the already wealthy and the corporations. And the one thing that we have is our ability to, to be able to, to seize control of the government and then create public policy, policy in order to constrain those folks. And we should use that. Also, as workers, we should use our ability as workers to organize together and be able to, that thing that I talk about, the inputs that we're putting into our economy, yeah, our labor, exactly. organize our labor in order to demand from the corporate class and from the wealthy the conditions that we want, and which is why I'm so excited that, that the Teamsters are, look like they might strike. On UPS, right? Yes. On UPS. That, that actors are on the verge of striking, that writers are striking, working people are recognizing the power, recognizing, oh, I have something, I have my labor, this thing that's so valuable that, yeah. that the ruling class takes for granted. If we organize together, Maurice, we can change the, the conditions. We are excited about this, we're excited yeah. to have you. You have another appointment, All right. and I don't want to break the promise, so thank you so much. It was so good, brother. It's been, been too long. Here. Absolutely, so thank you for being on Politics Done Right, my man. Absolutely, and can I just make a shout-out? Absolutely if, do if it. If anybody's interested in organizing with us at the Working Families Party, uh, the best thing you could do is you could either text WFP to 30403 or find us at Working Families on 
on Twitter, on Instagram, on all the social media, or go to our website, workingfamilies.org. Thank you so kindly. Thank it's you, been brother. a pleasure every time. Absolutely. And we must do this again sooner Let's than do it. the last time, okay? All right, take care. All right, take care now. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share.